homage to the Blessed One, the Noble One, the Perfectly Self-Awakened One. May you all set your hearts on listening to the Dhamma. So this opportunity now is a time for us to sit in meditation and take up this practice of meditating while listening to the Dhamma. As many practitioners from many different countries have all come together mostly from Singapore and Malaysia, starting from the 30th of July until this present day. And so eight nights have passed, it's the last day of this retreat during this morning. So this is a good time um, for everyone, an opportunity for everyone to come here and practice. You don't have to do the work that you normally do. For the people joining online, then they've been able to join as well in the time that they have off work. There's also the monastics in India and Bangalore who got great benefit from this retreat and from the work of the people who helped to organize this retreat. And so finding an opportunity in time like this, maybe once a year, for seven days or nine days, it gives us the chance to bring a consistency to our training for this period. So that we're able to see the results of the practice for ourselves, what exactly that is like. Because normally when we have to work, we have to receive many different sense impressions. And here's an opportunity for us to train in vipassana, in this clear seeing. It's when these external uh, sense impressions, such as sights and sounds, they make contact with the internal sense organs, like the eye. So there's this organ and there are also the nerves that run from that organ that need to be operating. Also the ears and the nerves of the ears, the nose, the nerves of the nose. So these all need to be working well. And then there's the Dhamma Aramanas, the thoughts, the proliferation that arises within the heart, which brings up a feeling of mano vinyana. It's kind of feeling within the mind. If it's a sight, then we call that uh, chaku vinyana, this feeling of sight. Then there's the feeling of hearing, the feeling of tasting, of smelling, of touching, also the feeling of having these Dhamma Aramanas there in the heart. So for us practitioners, the reason why our minds drop down and become gloomy, the reason why chaos appears within the heart, this all comes from receiving these sense impressions. So when we're sleeping, in a very deep sleep, and we don't have any dreams, then there's no feeling of suffering there. Because we're not, the mind isn't receiving any sensory experience. It's similar to like being in jhana. But when one is in jhana, there is also an experience of great rapture and happiness of samadhi, depending upon the level of jhana that one is able to reach. But this jhana, it's a means to suppress the defilements. But it's not an abandonment or an extraction of the defilements from the heart. So before the time of the Buddha, uh, then many people had trained in jhanas. There were these rishis or recluses who had jhana. But they weren't able to know and understand the Four Noble Truths. Those truths which allowed the Buddha to gain awakening and freedom from suffering. Now when the Buddha did that, then it's like he, as he said, he broke the ridgepole, which was avijja, the ridgepole of this house, and his mind gained purity. So that purity arose due to the wisdom in his heart. 
and there was also the karuna, the compassion there, that the Buddha had to train for and build these Bharamis for such a long time. So that we've all been able to come here for this retreat, it relies on the effort of many people who were working behind the scenes. And due to that Bharami that they were creating, through helping us to give us this opportunity, we've been able to come and practice the Dhamma. But the sacrifices that they've been making, if we compare with the sacrifices of the Buddha, they're minute. It's just like a speck of dust in the universe. So he practiced in the way that he did this um, selflessness that he had for our benefit due to the kindness and the compassion in his heart. And it's similar to those who have helped organize this retreat, have kindness and compassion for themselves, wishing for happiness for themselves and also happiness for others as well. And this too, developing kindness and compassion like this, this is kamata, a kamatana bhavana, um, practicing using these meditation objects. Because like taking the precepts like we did today, if we have kindness and compassion already there within our hearts, then already we are keeping the precepts, already virtuous. And these help us to be established well, to have this firm foundation for developing uh, mindfulness and samadhi and making these firm. When we receive any sensory experience, when there is contact between the external sense objects, the internal sense bases, then what feelings arise? And usually there's just constant aggravation and chaos in the mind. And when that's the case, then this is constantly being the cause for suffering to arise. And this dukkha arises immediately when there's this contact there. So for us practitioners, we should put in our efforts to look after our minds well. When we're in the monastery, then what we experience is quite peaceful. We have these fellow practitioners around us, we're in a peaceful society. But when we go out and live our normal lives with our family, in our workplace, in society, then we can meet with different things. And so what feelings come up then? And if mindfulness and samadhi, it's not complete, it's not ready, then the mind will be shaken by these experiences and there will be turmoil and confusion that arise within the heart. And then the mind becomes more gloomy, and it drops down and down. And so these things that are obstructions to our minds, they can often be controlling and overpowering our minds constantly. When we meet with these sensory experiences, that's also the point where we can bring up awakening if we have mindfulness, and if we develop our mindfulness well and contemplate at that point. If there's a sight that we are pleased by, we can ask ourselves, is that form constant? Does that form last? Can it endure? If there's something that we like, we contemplate that. This is something that doesn't last. This form that I like, it doesn't last. The forms outside, they don't last. These internal forms, they too don't last. And if we hear a sound, well, that sound comes from a form. And so that form is impermanent, and the sound also is impermanent. The hearing is impermanent. So the same with odors and tastes and tactile sensations. The same with thoughts, they arise and they cease. But the difficulty comes with attachment, taking them as being me and mine, and this is the cause for suffering to appear. And all we experience then is suffering, or well, they only cause suffering, this attachment. So therefore, Nibbana, or 
vipassana, finding freedom from suffering. It comes from walking this noble path of sila, samadhi and banya. So today you have taken the precepts and may you be firm in that and keeping those. And also try to keep your mindfulness in your uh, samadhi. Keep mindful here in the present moment. And perhaps wisdom will arise. You may be able to see into the nature of things uh, while listening to the Dhamma that everything is just a convention. Like the sala here, or that name, sala or hall, that's just a convention. In Thai they call it something else, in Chinese something else. Also, calling people male or female, this is just a convention. Monks, novices, lay people, all the labels we give, this is just convention. If we're going to view it in terms of liberation, and it's just four elements, it's five khandhas, there's no difference uh, between these things. So if we take form, we break it down into the elements, and then we break out, break down the elements, then what's left is just emptiness. There's emptiness that comes up. This form and emptiness are the same thing. Because form already has that emptiness there within it. So emptiness is form and form is emptiness. The reason we don't see that is because we are not yet wise. We haven't yet reached into the very heart of the teachings of the Buddha. Our mindfulness, our samadhi is still very little. So we can think about these things and maybe believe that we know them, but there isn't really a knowledge that comes up. So it's like thinking about the blood in the body. And so perhaps we can contemplate that and look at the blood which we have donated. And the blood that's outside the body, we can look at that and reflect, this isn't me. But all the blood that's still in the body, we still take that as being me. Or if we take some of our teeth out, or maybe some bones get extracted, then we can see that that's not me. But all of these things still within our mouths or within our body, then we see that as being me. So this is a very firmly embedded view. So may you contemplate with wisdom, being able to separate out earth, water, fire and air, separate the body out, break it down, until you see that there isn't anything, it's just empty. And the same with the the sounds that we hear, they come from form. The things that we smell, the things that we taste, it comes from form. And the Dhamma Aramanas, the thoughts that arise, these are thoughts about forms and uh, sounds, tastes, touch, odors. And all of these things are anicca, dukkha, anatta. And this is what allows for wisdom to arise right here at this point, seeing this. So if we see a male or see a female, you can realize that really that's not there. It's just samuti, it's just convention. That all the material things of this world are just conventions. They don't have a color, they don't have a name, they don't have a size. It's merely the coming together of the elements. It's merely fabricated phenomena. Things which have causes that give rise to them. But in the end, they just break apart. So when our mind actually, so when our mind sees a form, when there's the sight that appears and the, uh, this comes in and meets the sense basis, then the cycle, the process of dependent origination starts up and so suffering arises. So right here is where there's a fight that's going on within the heart. If the defilements have greater energy, then suffering will appear. But if this path of sila, samadhi and panya has more power, then suffering can't arise. And so it's a fight that's going on. 
But when we start to practice, then we lose far more than we win. The sense of self is stronger than uh, an insight into not-self. But even though that's the case, we shouldn't become discouraged. We should bring up our powers of forbearance. Because this quality of forbearance is the quality of wise people. So we endure first. For this fully self-awakened Buddha in some of his lives as a bodhisattva, um, he brought up this quality of endurance. His one life he was a recluse, a rishi, and he was developing kanti. And even though he felt no peace whatsoever, he still stayed and trained. And then there was a snake that bit his son. But through the power of his satcha, Barumi, uh, his son wasn't uh, hurt by that venom. So therefore may all of you uh, be firm in your satcha, your truthfulness in this practice, bringing up kanti, this patient endurance. And then one day, samadhi will arise and you'll see the results. The satta or belief will be firm. And so the so what we're doing is bringing rise to results here and trying to give rise um, sorry to these causes within the present moment. And if we do that well, if we make this present moment good through our actions, we speak well, we act well, we think well, then this is creating good karma. And anything which is unskillful through body, speech, or mind, we try to abandon that. We try to struggle against the kilesas in this way. But it's hard because these are things that are very deeply embedded. But still, we struggle all the same. The proliferation that goes on in the mind can be extremely quick. So we need to bring up our endurance here. We just carry on going until in the end then we get results from that. So may you put in your efforts, persevere in building this mindfulness and samadhi and wisdom. And then through that you'll be able to see into the nature of change, just like Venerable Anya Kondanya or Venerable Asaji did. The teaching that he gave Venerable Sariputta was about Dhammas and how they all have causes that give rise to them. So why do we take these things, these phenomena, to be me? And then we can go and blame other people as well. So like, if we get COVID, then maybe we blame someone else for giving us COVID. A husband or a wife gets it first and then they get it and then they blame the husband or wife. But this is just an issue of self. But if we look deeper than this, we can see that no one wants to get COVID. No one wants to get old, no one wants to get sick, no one wants to give their illnesses to other people. But there are just causes and conditions that give rise to this. So if we see things in that way, then we don't get angry, we don't become resentful but rather we forgive each other instead, seeing that we're all friends in old age, sickness and death. And if we can view things in this light, then our minds can become peaceful, we can get into samadhi and wisdom can arise. So if we look deeply, then who is it that gets old? Who grows ill? Who dies? And there's no one there. These elements, they're not me. So all of these problems, they disappear when we're able to let go. And that's really the important thing in our practice, is letting go. We can let go when we have wisdom, when we know that all physical and mental things are anicca, dukkha, anatta. And that's when our minds are able to put things down, when we're not attaching anymore. So there's no more love, there's no more hate, there's no more anger or fear, 
the mind is empty through purity, and this is Nibbāna. So this is Nibbāna in the heart. And when we're able to let go, then that's when we can experience Nibbāna. We can realize this emptiness in the heart reaches Nibbāna, turns into Nibbāna. So we tell ourselves these things, they're not sure, they're inconstant. Whenever the mind retracts from that state, whenever it starts attaching, we say, it's not sure, it's not sure. And then we bring it back to Nibbāna again, having a lot of mindfulness, having a lot of wisdom, trying to see the Dhamma, trying to see Nibbāna. So when samādhi and mindfulness and wisdom are full, and they gather together, and we can cross over from being a beautiful being, a kalyana chana, to being an arya chana, a noble being, without any difficulty. And this is something that all beings can do, that all of us can do in this life, if we have effort, if we carry on practicing. In the same way that we've all studied until we graduated, we all have worked until we've been able to do our occupations well. So in the same way, if we really give all that we have to this practice, it's not beyond our ability to reach the Dhamma within this life. So may you set your hearts on this, establishing your mindfulness in the present moment, a lot. Whenever you see a sight or hear a sound, a contact, an odor or a flavor or a touch, and try not to give rise to attachment, because if there is attachment there, then this will be the cause for suffering to arise. But it's also not the case that people for whom their sense organs aren't functioning well, that they experience freedom from suffering. Because even though they may not see things, still there is chaos within their minds. So really the important thing is wisdom. The wisdom that allows us to let go, that allows us to see all things as being empty. So if we get angry, we can ask ourselves, well, who is angry? If there's greed, then who's greedy? If there's delusion, then what is that delusion? Who is it that dies? Who's really there? So wisdom can arise from contemplating this. So may all you follow up on your minds, looking after them well. And if you do this, then you'll be able to know the Dhamma and see the Dhamma. But whatever the case, may the Bharami of the Buddha, the Bharami of the Dhamma, the Bharami of the Sangha protect you well. May it protect your family so that you will have happiness in this life. May your work go smoothly. May you travel safety, safely and be free from all sickness. And may you all know the Dhamma and see the Dhamma.